Who here can remember being a teenager? Ooh, all of you, brilliant. In 2010, there was a London borough who was thinking quite a lot about teenagers. The teenagers in this London borough were no longer coming to their community centres. They used the data of declining numbers to make a case to invest in new equipment, in computer games, in football goals, in table tennis tables. And yet, still, people weren't coming. Teenagers weren't coming. A puzzle. A few decades earlier, BT was also having a puzzle. They had created this amazing new customer service, the first automated telephone directory service. You could have your number speedily <coughs> given to you. And yet again, no one was using it. Odd. These things fascinate me because you've got data creating insight or speeding things up, and yet something's missing. Now, I'll come back to these at the end, and maybe you can think about what the answers are as I go through my talk. As a civil servant and a designer, I've always been nerdly interested in both analytical stuff and also much more creative stuff. When I was really little, I used to go to my friends' houses. And with my imaginary friend Jack, we used to go round, but not to play, but to tidy people's rooms. And now on my shelves at home, all my books are very neatly ordered, but not through alphabet, but through colour. You can see them, yellow, orange, red, purple, green and blue. Ordered, but beautiful. And at school, I won the statistics prize for that crucial scientific discovery that blue Smarties follow a normal statistical distribution. It's great. But also that... You can eat 20 packs of Smarties in your lunch hour. <laughs> and now I've been a civil servant for 10 years. We've been working in the big departments of the state, like the Home Office, Cabinet Office, number, and number 10, in very traditional, very important um, policy-making roles. But all of that time, I've kind of, I don't know, had this niggle, this hankering to do something a bit more creative. So at school, I rebelled if you can call it that, I did my art GCSE in my spare time after school on Wednesdays. And at work, I, after eight years, thought, I've had enough, I'm going to pack my bags and go off to Berlin and become an artist. Artist in the day, serving cocktails at the night. But after two years of a poor artist life, I felt I had to come back. I kind of missed the really amazing uses that government can put words and numbers to, things that can make society better. So I came back, but I didn't want to miss that creativity. And I didn't want to keep flip-flopping between analytical and creative stuff all the time. I wanted to combine both. So I was a policymaker, and I also studied graphic design. And then it became apparent to me that you can combine both. Two women in particular really inspired me. Florence Nightingale, she presented data on diseases in the Crimean War, and for the first time revealed that most of the deaths were actually preventable. And that changed the course of nursing. Phyllis Purcell, she walked 23,000 streets in London, here, and she created what we now know and love as the A to Z. So both of these women were designers that used data for social good. And now, I am so lucky to work in Policy Lab, where I get to do this stuff every single day. Policy Lab was set up to support departments to use digital design and data techniques to make policies better. We combine data science, which uses really, really powerful computer techniques and applies them to huge amounts of data, really complex stuff. And we combine that with ethnography, which takes human experiences and behaviours and emotions and really tries to understand why people do what they do. And we bring these things together, we combine them, and we share them with a diverse range of people to come up with amazing new ideas to make government better. Our first project was on uh, policing in the 21st century, supporting victims of crime. 
And there was one woman, let's call her Jane. Jane was a victim of antisocial behaviour. And she was told by the police to keep a diary. And so she kept her diary. She showed us where she kept it. Her bedside table. And when she filled it out, the last thing at night before she went to sleep. Can you imagine how much that must be for Jane? And how much better it would be for Jane if she could have something online that she could uh, share this information with the police as soon as it happens so the police can start solving her problems. Now, there were many, many more rich observations like this. And we shared those with a group of diverse people from chief constables, police officers, neighbourhood watch members. And they used their human creativity to come up with a whole range of other ideas. They came up with ideas for young people to uh, report crime using Minecraft. Or for older people to be able to sit on their sofas in their living rooms and give it evidence at court. Now, all of these things are a bit out there, but they gave us the creative spark so we could create online crime recording. But to take that from a small pilot in Surrey and Sussex and to scale it across England and Wales, which is what's happening now, we needed data. We needed data analysts to help us make the case that this would save £3.7 million per year and 180,000 officer hours. Our second project was around health and work. So in the UK, you've got 2.5 million people on health-related benefits. And that cost us £15 billion per year. But we know that the right work can be really good for people. In this project, we combined data science and ethnography throughout. The data science showed us that people are more likely to go on health benefits if they've been in their job a really short amount of time. And the ethnography displayed that it was the relationship between the line manager and their employer that was actually critical in whether someone stays or goes. The data science showed us that women with depression are much more likely than men with depression to stay in work. And this played out in the ethnography. Uh, another woman, let's call her Vanessa. Vanessa had been battling with depression for a long, long time. She had been too scared to go to her boss to do anything about it. She didn't feel she had anything to show him. And then she got breast cancer. And can you imagine what she said to us? That she was relieved that she had breast cancer because then she could go with her boss and show something physical and she got time off work and she was able to deal with both illnesses su su successfully. So through all, our, all that project, we combined the data science and the ethnography. They were always talking to each other, sharing their hypotheses and confirming them, and we built up this really rich picture of exactly what was going on. And again, we used that, we shared that with people, and we came up with lots of ideas for how to support people to manage their health conditions and work, which we're now testing across England and Wales. Data and design require, therefore, a new type of policymaker. When I first started the civil service, I didn't know what a policy was, and I certainly didn't know how to make one. And for those of you in the room who do not know what the policy is, it can range, it's a government position on something, and it can range from anything very specific for um, the amount of benefit that is paid to a 70-year-old lady who's also a carer, all the way through to whether or not we go to war or not. Now, at the time, when I started, we were called generalists. And for me, I thought we had to be masters of everything. Now, I soon realised that that is not possible at all. And I remember someone saying to me, a good policymaker doesn't have all the information, but they do know where to go and get it. Great, I thought, I can get all of this information and I can come up with all the ideas. In a world of data and design, that's not true. Data and design can provide the information, but it also can come up with the ideas. So a better definition <coughs> is that a policymaker doesn't have all the information, nor the skills, nor the techniques, nor the ideas, but it does know how to bring people with them together. 
they need to be able to work with data analysts to spot patterns in data at the same time as working with ethnographers to really get underneath that data and explain why things are happening. They need to be able to work with data scientists to automate really clunky bureaucratic processes, but also to be able to design them so that they actually fit in with people's real lives. And they need to work with graphic designers so they can visualise and make accessible very complex data that the civil service loves and share it back out with the public so we can all generate ideas together. Now, not all of us are policy makers or designers or data scientists, but we can all use a data and a design approach in our lives. You might be someone who loves Sudoku but can't uh, draw a stick man. Or you might be someone who spends our lives in art galleries but can't add up to save their life. We're all using all the time our creative and our logical selves. Take renting or buying a house. You have to make a cost-benefit analysis, make sure you can afford it. But also you need huge amounts of creativity to turn your house into your home. This is important because data is our future. Right now, we are generating 2.5 quintillion bytes of data every single day. That's 25 with 17 zeros after it. Every single time you go online and search, you use your store card, you tap in with your Oyster card, you are creating data. And experts think that in 20 years from now, we're going to be creating 100 times as much. CityMapper is an app which uses data, government data, to tell you how to get from A to B. Great, there's lots of other apps that do that. But what's brilliant about it is it uses human stories and human needs to present that data in the way that we find useful. So RainSafe is a service which not only tells you how to get from A to B, but tells you the driest way to do so. So if now we're gonna have apps that will help us get from A to B in the driest possible way, in the future, we're going to have autonomous vehicles who can drive us there for us. If now we can use our uh, Fitbits on our smartphones to tell us how many steps we're taking every single day. In the future, we're going to have smart fridges that will monitor our health and order in healthy food for us. And if now we're just about starting to um, get elderly people to remotely share their blood pressure with their GPs, from their homes. In the future, they'll have remote robot companions to help them do that. So data is going to completely transform our lives in ways that we can't even imagine. But we have to make sure that it's well designed. Data, after all, is human. We all generate it. We're the ones who give the data mostly. And we're the ones who do something as a result of what the data tells us. So let me take you back to those first, first two stories. We had community centres and telephones. A London borough was having all of its trouble with the teenagers not going to the community centres, the data showing numbers are declining, but no one could understand why. So they got some researchers to go out and actually spend time with these teenagers, find out what they do like doing, what they don't like doing. And what did they find? Well, not surprisingly, Girls, in the most part, don't like computer games, football goals, and table tennis. And the boys? The boys actually prefer hanging out with the girls. So, a very, very simple story that boys mostly prefer hanging out with girls explains the data. The community centre was able to invest in equipment for girls, and numbers went up. And BT? who had this amazing new speedy uh, automated service for the public, no one was using it. Well, they didn't trust it. They did not trust that a computer could look up a number so quickly. So someone had to have that aha moment of going, we need to build in trust. We need to record the sound of someone flipping through a ginormous phone book, and we'll play that to them while they wait their small amount of time. People believed it. People started using it. So let me now leave you with one final thought. Is data the new oil? If it is, we have to treat it with so much care. We have to make sure that we're using it in a way that humans would want. And design can help us do that. Like a hybrid car, 
We need data and design together in combination. And we need hybrid policymakers to help us do that. Thank you.